Right. So I'm going to discuss about uh, new frontiers in cloud and edge computing. The requirements uh, from this cloud edge computing are driven by real world applications. Particularly, I'm taking from two kinds of application. One is big data. So this big data means mass amount of data. Then another another one is Internet of Things applications where real time requirements are uh, uh, data generated and they need to be analyzed and then uh, and respond uh, and response need to be uh, created immediately and rapidly. So these are two class of applications that we are taking into consideration uh, in this uh, talk. But of course, I will talk about cloud computing, some of the recent advances in this area. Uh, then how they are supporting uh, uh, these recent applications uh, that are emerging uh, in the field, in the society, in the government application, in uh, industrial applications. So as uh, Dilip introduced, I'm from University of Melbourne. So we have cloud computing and distribution laboratory at Melbourne University where we conduct the research. And we also have a, a company called Manjarasoft. This was a spin-up company from University of Melbourne almost 10 years ago. So where uh, one of the software technologies that we developed is commercially made available, a commercially great solution. So I will discuss about that also as we go along. Okay, so here is the outline of uh, today's uh, you know, discussion. First, I will give you very briefly uh, uh, the different computing paradigms that have emerged during last uh, 50 years, uh, then bring you to uh, edge computing, cloud computing, IoT. Uh, so then we will discuss about uh, uh, cloud architecture, which is market or in a cloud architecture. Uh, as part of the discussion, I will also present a software platform called Aneka that we developed. Uh, then of course, within that, we'll also discuss uh, uh, the architecture and some of the example applications that of Aneka technology. So I will discuss uh, two classes of application. One is big data oriented, other is also IoT. Uh, especially these days, uh, um, uh, applications from uh, AI or deep learning are becoming popular. So I will discuss uh, briefly about a case study on application of Aneka in uh, object detection or deep learning applications. So uh, then we will discuss new trends uh, um, in this area, particularly introducing you Internet of Things. So that is one of the key topic uh, for today discussion and the requirements of this IoT. And then the new computing paradigms such as fog edge computing and how they are going to support this IoT application. As part of this, we will discuss about uh, one of the software we developed called Fogbus. And I will illustrate that uh, the Fogbus architecture and implementation um, as applied to a application in healthcare. Especially nowadays, uh, the healthcare health issue uh, has uh, pretty much uh, controlling everybody in the world. Uh, you know, this is COVID, coronavirus. So perhaps uh, that is very uh, relevant to talk about healthcare application. So perhaps we need to extend further by developing some kind of IoT new class of application that could be deployed on an ACA or, uh, or in uh, Pugbus uh, for next generation healthcare. And also, I will briefly mention about a simulator called IFOXIM that we developed in order to support modeling and simulation of next generation air and cloud computing environments, and then simulating application, and also developing new approach towards how to manage multiple users uh, in a given environment to support their uh, requirements, such as quality of service requirement. In this case, quality of services can be time by which you need answers. So then we will conclude and I'll also briefly discuss about some of the new directions in this area. Uh, obviously, some of you may want to do projects, uh, you know, whether it is a bachelor project or even a PhD project, there are many open issues uh, that can be explored. So to begin with, as you know, so this, uh, the computing part like, uh, From your placement. Uh... Hello. Okay. So. I hope everybody can hear. Huh? All right. So uh, now, uh, so there are many uh, computing paradigms have emerged. Uh, you can see from 1960s to I am projecting up to 2030, 30, you know, what are the different computer paradigms that have emerged? 
And you will notice, you know, during 60s, as many of you studied in uh, computer history, that during 60s, we had computer, they were called mainframes. So here, the, here you see a picture of a mainframe uh, computer. Uh, so this was a very popular uh, model of computing. Then, of course, uh, later on in, 70, in, 70, in 1970s, many computers came into picture because mainframes are very expensive. Often, just one or two such big computing systems built for the whole country and uh, perhaps made available as a service to users. Then later on, instead of having a big mainframe, the concept of mini computers came into picture during between 70s and 80s. So, so this also uh, was very expensive process. You know, computing system uh, companies such as Digital Equipment Corporation (DEC) so they played an important role. So IBM was primarily credited with mainframes. Then mini computers was credited to Digital Equipment Corporation. Then later on, client-server computing came, came into picture. So client and server. That means there'll be a big server, then multiple client computers at offices. They can connect the big server and start using it. That's called client-server computing. Then came World Wide Web. So rather than having a server and a client in one organization, can, you can have a service in uh, somewhere remotely that can be used for serving, especially you know, remote content for sharing documents in large scale. That World Wide Web came, uh, came into picture. Of course, during the last 25 years, we saw many advances in the name of web, such as web services, service oriented computing model. So that has become popular as a result. Now you can build applications. So I can build an application running on my computer. You can build a new application running on your computer. You can expose that capability as a service. Then somebody else can build a new service running on their computer. They can compose service from one and two and put together that is a new service. So this is called service oriented computing model, service oriented architecture and, and so on. Then of course, during the last 10 years, we saw a growing popularity of cloud computing. So essentially making computing as a utility. So just like when you build a house at, uh, say for example, in Mathura, so you don't have to dig a well. Instead, you can connect yourself to the water supply board, then you just consume the water and pay for what you consume, that is called utility model. And the same thing is true with electricity, and the same thing is true with uh, networks and mobile phones. When you buy a mobile phone, you don't build a network of your own. Instead, you subscribe to a network service provider, uh, you know, such as Airtel or, uh, you know, Optus or uh, Telstra here in Australia, different, different companies provide that networking service. And they are providing as a paid service. You connect to the network, start using it, you pay for what you consume. So this is the pay as you go model. The same model of computing now come to, uh, you know, mo same model of utility has come to computing. That is through cloud computing. And today, for example, uh, you know, uh, the application of cloud computing, numerous applications. So I will discuss uh, many of those. Uh, many of those applications you are using and then why we need such a capability uh, called cloud computing to support those applications. And in fact, today we are uh, talking to each other, doing this video conference, which is also led by cloud computing. The video conference server, uh, this is called Zoom, running in a cloud, then it can uh, facilitate our interaction, then it supports reasonable scalability up to people easily doing 500 uh, participants. And also uh, you can store and you can uh, record and uh, play it later. And they also have many replica sites. If one site is uh, unavailable, they, they can migrate to other places. So all these things are happening, So which is very good. So then, uh, uh, of course, uh, there is a concept of Internet of Things. We know Internet. Internet, uh, you know, if you look at the history of Internet, the Internet was created for the, in the, the main reason for creating Internet was to enable access to large scale mainframes as services. Because as I said, in 60s, mainframes are very expensive, just one per country. And uh, everybody cannot afford to buy such mainframe. So at that time, there was a need for network to connect businesses and universities to the mainframe so that they can use computing services. So that was the vision with the internet started. Then of course, this was internet has grown and grown. Now it became a worldwide network, a network of networks of computers. And now the concept from networks of computers to networks of everything. So we want to make everything to be part of internet. So yeah, uh, so uh, we will discuss about the IoT. Then as this Internet of Things becoming very popular, uh, then uh, the current model of computing face challenges, uh, unable to support them. Therefore, we now have a new model called fog and edge computing. So we'll discuss all of this concept as we go along. This edge computing, fog computing is a bit more recent innovation and now rapidly emerging. 
and I will discuss about some of the open issues, challenges, the state of the art to begin with, and then what are the open issues. I'll give you some examples of how it has been done, and there's a lot of opportunities for you to explore uh, in the context of new class application that uh, we can use uh, uh, in terms of things for creating smart environment. Okay, so this uh, notion of, uh, of course, now, uh, today, we make a lot of decisions based on the data. So this is a data-driven world. So uh, uh, in the past, uh, this data-driven concept has been there, especially if you look at big scientific problems, such as high energy physics, astronomy, big medical problem. So they had a large scale instrument that capture massive amount of data, then they're creating like terabytes of terabytes of data, and then scientists have to analyze that terabytes of data to make some discovery. And for example, uh, this was used in many applications, like for example, high energy physics. Uh, you know, a few years ago, like four or five years ago, high energy physics they discovered what they called, uh, you know, Higgs, Higgs boson particle. So that was made possible through uh, generating this LST uh, data. The data is distributed around uh, scientists around the world. They are analyzed using their supercomputers and the grid computing, then discovered. Same thing also happened with uh, astronomy community also. Uh, okay, so those are big scientific problem. But now this data-driven concept has shifted towards a large population. So we now have a large population in the world. Of course, they were there, but the technology advances is moved towards how do we support uh, this notion of big data in a large-scale population context where we can enable many interesting applications such as uh, interesting healthcare application or interesting uh, security application, like security. Uh, application uh, very important of course apart from supporting interaction but now for example if you have an iot enabled application so perhaps this today uh, situation of covid where iot is uh, constantly monitor a person uh, then uh, you know uh, and then everybody networks uh, then the data is available at the data driven world and they can make a rapid decision on how to manage uh, this epidemic. Uh, I think there is something uh, people didn't uh, know, no one foresee, foresee that such a thing happened. But anyway, now it happened. I'm sure over a period of time, you will see the evolution of this IoT towards such application. This is a great opportunity for some of our students, you know, young brains to think about uh, this area. And coming to cloud computing, as I said, cloud computing offers, you know, utility oriented services. You subscribe to services and use it and pay for what you consume just like electricity, telephone network services, and water services. So this is a new class of network. So from network distribution networks to uh, you know, uh, cloud uh, network of services. So here is the uh, high level view of how the whole thing uh, looks like. And you see that uh, uh, there are set up uh, resources. Uh, here is a cloud called public cloud. So this was set up by some third party. So for example, a company like Microsoft or a Google or Amazon, IBM, someone sets up this facility for you. And you as a consumer or the other end, so you might be using it for different application, enterprise application, business application, or applications in uh, different areas. So you can take those uh, service requirements and then send your, instead of having application running on your system, you send it to a cloud where actual processing is done, you get back results. And of course, you actually pay for what you consume. So this is a model of uh, you know cloud computing. So uh, here it looks like as a consumer, you might have subscribed to one service provider. So when you subscribe to one service provider, this doesn't mean that service provider does everything for you. That service provider actually using service of other providers, combining them together and delivering service to you. Say for example, Dropbox. Dropbox is a cloud storage service. Uh, it provides you a highly scalable access to uh, uh, services that are distributed around the world. And this Dropbox uh, is a cloud storage. Actually, this company Dropbox.com is essentially a brokering service. And they don't own infrastructure uh, storage themselves. They instead harness the storage from multiple places and offers you unified access to the large scale storage. So this is what Dropbox has done. And this is the kind of architecture nowadays, uh, more and more uh, cloud technologies uh, uh, will follow. Okay, so that is about uh, how, um, you know, uh, Dropbox or others are uh, moving. So now moving forward uh, with high-level architecture, here in this case, you can subscribe to compute resources, you can subscribe to data resources, you can subscribe to application resources, uh, uh, you can subscribe to storage resources. Based on the requirement, you use it and pay for it to consume model. 
So nowadays there are already various service providers, including storage. You can rent a storage, you can rent compute, you can rent data set, you can rent application, or you can rent all of them together. So this model has now become uh, real, uh, real. Okay, what are the applications of this technology? So let me highlight briefly uh, the known ones. Then after that, I will discuss about many others that are emerging. Okay, first, of course, uh, the traditional uh, business applications such as customer relations management, uh, the enterprise use planning, e-commerce. So nowadays they are available as a cloud service already. So which is good. So that's already happening. So moving towards uh, more popular ones are these consumer applications such as many of you as students are using it. For example, Twitter. So Twitter, just a micro messaging service running on a cloud. So as uh, the number of uh, persons uh, you know, using this can change, they accordingly they can provision right number of resource and support application. So this is a Twitter capable application and service. Then the Dropbox I already mentioned, even the Facebook is running on a cloud because the Facebook, you know, as you know, users, especially now, uh, number of users joining Facebook is, is rapid increasing. For example, you know, when I have my Facebook account, so up to now, I probably used to have, you know, 1,500 uh, uh, friends, virtual friends. Of course, I only knew few people in person. The rest all are just uh, became virtual friends. Uh, then uh, during last 20 days or 30 days, I'm noticing number of people wanting to become friends are increasing every day. You know, almost 100 new people uh, making a connection. That means uh, everybody held up at your home. Uh, you know, what can they do? So they want to know what is happening to other people. Uh, so they just create a Facebook page and try to become friend like that. They're becoming with me. I already, you know, unable to deal with uh, this virtual friend sequence already. So this kind of Facebook system, if it is in a centralized place, so it won't be able to offer the best responsive, uh, responsive uh, services to you. So therefore, what they did was they created multiple cloud data centers in different places around the world. Then uh, the, you know, once you log into portal, automatically they classify users and position them into different geographies seamlessly. So this way, all of us get a best response time quickly. Because Facebook is not just uh, you know posting a message, but also they have to recognize who are the people in the application and what kind of what kind of messages you are uh, you know communicating. Sometimes they also do analytics to find out what are the trends. So this requires uh, massive computing capability which they build themselves. Okay. Those are the applications. Now coming to 2020, just recently, we, you know, we looked at, uh, uh, I actually looked into what is happening on the internet every 60 seconds. In a minute, what happens? So for example, in 2019, and right now in 2020, in a minute. And you will notice just looking at applications such as this Facebook, Netflix, uh, uh, or uh, you know, Twitter, or Tinder, or uh, you know, YouTube, these are our uh, standard consumer, uh, Oriented application, and you can see the massive number of user in number of users that in, use is increasing. So just within uh, uh, you know last year December they had one million users. You know you uh, say one million people used to log in in a minute, but now uh, thanks to COVID, within uh, no time it increased to 1.3. And if you look at today, maybe it's 1.5 million. So people in log in at a time. So huge number. And number of messages that are are uh, broadcasted are massive. And number of people accessing YouTube massive and e-commerce sites and spending online is a drastic increase. And all these applications, where are they running? They're actually running on a cloud. So because as you know, number of users that use this can drastically go up and also come down with time. So during uh, peak hours, so it may be uh, you know a huge number, and during off peak hours, number of users increasing can be less. So therefore, they must be able to uh, uh, include required capability to that application. In the cloud, it is a pay as you go basis, rent basis. You require you rent a required capability uh, to meet your application needs. So therefore, dynamically, we should be able to change as necessary. This is an on-demand computing system. Okay, and you can see these are huge number of applications. This is what is happening right now. You know, this is a just a few days back. I got this data, and you can see in 60 seconds mass few number of users are using cloud services. So, which is actually a good thing. Uh, then of course, now uh, because of COVID and then this, uh, this Zoom almost literally unknown uh, company and unknown service, it became very popular during last uh, one year. And uh, you probably heard that even their stock market value, 
uh, stock price what was uh, some x uh, x dollar per uh, uh, you know uh, stock item but now it became almost double triple on the other end all of the stocks whether the banks or many other they come down where the zoom went up so this is a dynamic environment of course they need this uh, very nice uh, scalable environment and of course security so there are some security concerns but we should be careful and of course they can be dealt with by our proper uh, okay that is a uh, foundation concept application now let me discuss about as we go deeper inside cloud what is it like so you know i initially said cloud is a remote service you can rent but what actually happens inside so at the top if you look at layered architecture so at the bottom physical machines that are interconnected and these can be within one place or across multiple places around the world okay so there's a physical machine at the top we have users and of course users uh, here there is a there are multiple types of users the users who want to run application are one type and users who just want to use application service are another type anyway let us say users who want to use a application service such as healthcare or um, business or enterprise or analytics application and these users when they make a request to cloud they need to define the requirement so especially application users so for example uh, when we use this uh, uh, zoom so we define so for example our university uh, got this uh, zoom account and they define the some of the quality expectation we are a paid customers so we define requirement accordingly first okay they have to see how much resource they got can they admit and honor this request so here we got uh, uh, you know user request comes in the first there is something called admission control system admission control is applied everywhere some places this is just open some places not of course in this uh, you know zoom tag i just kept open anyone who knows my this zoom the link you can join in but whereas the link that came from uh, your university you know they sent you here is uh, zoom id here is password so they are doing admission control then when i said that hey my some of my team members want to join for this talk they said oh looks like it's very really difficult for us to do so we open up to everybody that that's why we are using a uh, mind because i am a bit more open person uh, so i don't mind anybody to join in the world who want to hear our talk so we are we want to share the knowledge for with everybody so no problem so there is admission control so here also in cloud there is admission control so you need to uh, make sure that we can really honor the uh, you know quality that is expected for example if i made this zoom open to all india you now we would have a billion people who try to join then we won't be able to serve that's a challenge and i'm glad that right now we only have 120 students uh, who are joined uh, thank you so now once we admit a request in order to serve the request in in cloud environment you know they don't rent you a physical machine so there is no physical computer named after you what they rent you is a virtual machine when you make a request to cloud uh, define your requirement accordingly it will create a virtual machine so here is the virtual machine that created now once you create a virtual machine we need to map that virtual machine to a physical machine and the question is which physical machine so for example if the if for example uh, let's say all of us are in india now i create a zoom session they create a virtual machine and then where do they map that uh, virtual machine they can either map virtual machine to a physical machine located in australia or located in india if as a host if i was in india india probably they would have mapped that virtual machine to a uh, location in india data center which uh, which is there then that way we all uh, be uh, you know sort very nicely but of course here uh, if it is a dynamic system they can even do many uh, decision making process here so anyway say virtual machine is created and map to physical machine then after that application service is running when application service is running so number of users start using this uh, service then of course number of users can increase or decrease with time yeah so you know when we started our talk we probably had around uh, uh, 70 students then it became 120 then it became just now i just saw it became 117 maybe it will decrease or increase it can happen so sometimes students or somebody want to take a break or somebody knocks on the door therefore you disturb you disconnect so this way number of users can go up and down so we need to make sure that services are delivered to consumers the best quality and then for that if i start running with one virtual machine that can serve say 50 users but number of users are increasing to 120 then if i start running that application on one virtual machine uh, which is meant for 60 students then what happens 
uh, if 120 students join, we start experiencing you know, slowness in our responses. Maybe the, you might hear very slow or maybe a lot of things may not happen, okay? So, so this is a challenge. I think some students are raising hand. Uh, so they, they don't need to raise hand, keep it down. So we will have a question answer at the uh, end of the session. Okay, so you can see number of users increasing and decreasing and that we see already this dynamism. So therefore in cloud, we need to provision right amount of resource. The cloud would have a cloud resource manager that monitors how many users are coming in, how much quality of service we promise to users, and are we able to meet the requirement uh, with the existing allocation. If not, dynamically add extra resource. Okay, so here you can see when number of users increase, we increase number of virtual machine that we are renting. So now once we increase virtual machine renting again, so the virtual machine that we rented don't have to be mapped to one location. It can be across multiple cloud data centers. So in this talk, we have participants from China, we have participants from India, we have participants from Australia. Okay, so now if it created a few more virtual machines, perhaps the So cloud platform, you know, must seamlessly uh, scale across, uh, place some of those in different locations in a seamless manner without user, uh, you know, knowledge. Then of course, uh, in one hour time, uh, we are going to conclude. As we come into conclu concluding, number of uh, participants may decrease. At that time, suppose if it comes to uh, just few number of people, we don't want to uh, rent those many virtual machines. We will just decrease it. So that is called decreasing, correct? So this is called elastic property. You increase uh, number of resources that are necessary, then when uh, the demand decreases, you decrease it. So this property of cloud is very, very important. And the success of cloud is because of elasticity. Okay, elasticity is a very important uh, property of cloud computing. So therefore, some people also call it as a elastic computing. In fact, if you look for, you know, uh, search on internet right now, elastic computing, Australian uh, government uh, things. You know, uh, recently because of this COVID, there are a lot of people, uh, you know, lost jobs. Then government is providing, you know, allowance to those people who lost jobs. So, so then many people who lost job, they start registering, you know, very heavily into the government uh, system that they lost job, they need a government, uh, you know, some uh, payment. So when everybody start doing it, the system becomes so overloaded, the government uh, system broke down. As a result, so many people went and stood in front of the office and now, of course, uh, you know, this is COVID, uh, social distancing, very, too many people crowded there. So then this is where people looked at, hey, if the government has utilized elastic computing services from cloud, we would not have experienced this, uh, uh, this situation. You can see already we're experiencing. So whenever we have application and the infrastructure that is not designed for this elasticity, we are all failing under this uh, demand that coming from many users, whether they're government services or healthcare services. So the cloud computing is becoming even more popular as a result of this uh, COVID, correct? Everybody at home, and then uh, they cannot go physically to one place, the load get distributed and services are being delivered through cloud computing. I hope this uh, uh, you know, concept is become very clear, elasticity, expanding or shrinking as necessary. So this is a very important, uh, I, please understand this concept very well. Uh, so because this has implication on how you build your application. Now you think in terms of soft engineering, you want to create an application that is uh, elastic in nature, that can expand or shrink. Let me see uh, who is typing uh, some chat session, uh, whether there is any big issue. Um, no issue, right? Okay. Okay, hopefully no issue. Um, yeah, sometime I'm just monitoring what is happening with uh, different participants. Okay, all right, so this elasticity. So let me explain what is this elasticity and why it matters. The first, uh, so because if you provision uh, more resource than you need, needed, you have to pay for that uh, extra resource. Then especially if you're not using and you have to pay for it, you know, you won't be happy. So therefore you only want to pay for what is actually needed. Okay, therefore we need to have a dynamic process of uh, deciding how, what is needed, what is not needed. So that is called autonomic management of cloud computing. And, uh, and then of course, in our real life also, we follow this city. Uh, and then how to expand string. I can give you many interesting examples of uh, this elasticity concept. You know, expanding or shrinking. 
So, um, so this is a, in computer science. There are two kinds of uh, uh, two kinds of uh, scalability. The first one is called vertical scalability, and the second one is called horizontal scalability. So, vertical scalability is achieved by building faster hardware. Okay. So, whereas horizontal scalability is achieved by uh, you know provisioning extra resources. So, in computer science, uh, in IT technology. The virtual scalability was achieved by building faster, faster hardware. That is by building uh, new microprocessors. Uh, you know, during last 10-15 uh, years, you might have noticed we have you know many as companies like Intel, AMD, and others. They release different type of microprocessors. Some of them were like initially something like 40 uh, megahertz, then became 1 gigahertz, then became 1.5. Like this, they produce uh, you know newer, newer microprocessor with higher uh, clock frequency. But they reached a point, they're not able to produce any more you know, faster processor. That means they reach the limit, speed of light, and the thermodynamic constant, they reach the limit. That means the vertical scalability is stopped. So what do we do? So the next class of architecture is to look into horizontal scalability. So in computer architecture, horizontal scalability is achieved by having multiple processors that are put together. So this is, you know, I can give you some analogy. Like for example, when baby is born, the baby height is maybe 15 centimeters, with the time, baby grows vertically, vertically, vertically. Like this, it grows, grows, grows. Maybe for around 18, 20 years. Then it'll grow maybe up to the height of, say, 160 centimeter. Correct? It'll grow vertically. And how long you can grow more? So we reach the limit. We cannot grow anymore. So, for example, I, I have reached vertically this height. Now, if, uh, you know, this is by 20 years, stopped vertical growth. And if I want to grow, of course, the desire for growth is not stopped. And how do we grow? Then we start growing horizontally, correct? So this is horizontal expansion. So this already happens. But of course, uh, this horizontal expansion, how do we shrink? Maybe by doing certain yoga, you can shrink, uh, shrink to yourself. Other, uh, generally, it is difficult, but you have to shrink, otherwise not healthy. So it is going to be expensive to maintain body. And also similar in cloud computing also, when you, when you have multiple resources that are expanded, if you do not release them, they charge a higher price. So you have to shrink them. So uh, you know, shrink it. So this capability is elasticity. So sometimes people like Hanuman have this capability. You know, Hanumanji. So Hanumanji, when he, when he flew from uh, Rameshwaram to uh, Lanka on the way, he come across a demon. The demon, you know, says, uh, says, you cannot really cross me. So she said, oh, okay, so if you can escape, you can cross me. So what did Hanuman do when she, this demon was open full mouth, to eat him. Okay. So, the... so uh, we teach you people because we have gained knowledge for now quite some time. We are I think somebody video is still on. We have studied in our curriculum. So we are taking care of all these things while delivering the lecture. But at the same time, we need to update our knowledge. real world Somebody who has, okay, so um, okay, so that is a, you expand, then Hanuman became like a small, like a fly, then enter into the mouth of this demon, then demon impressed, let him go. When Hanuman presented himself in front of Ravana, what did he do? You know, they didn't honor him. So, so he just sat on, he created a chair of himself and sat on his uh, tail. And later on, uh, Hana, you know, Ravana put, uh, uh, fire yeah, to Hanuman. Oh, what did Hanuman do? Yeah, yeah. Hanuman just expanded himself, then you know, brand the whole Lanka. So he is able to expand a shrink as necessary. So that is called elasticity. So therefore, when we build our applications or system, we need to make sure that we are able to create very scalable, expandable shrinking capability within our application, within our system. Okay, this is a conceptual concept. Now let us take a look at how can we do this in the real world. How can we create applications that are elastic? How can we provision resources in elastic manner? So let me present uh, one of our software technical called Neka. It's a cloud application platform that we developed uh, here and available uh, as a product uh, from Mandra Soft. So this can be used for building, uh, you know, uh, resource intensive and elastic application. So first, this Neka comes with uh, uh, two components. The first one is, uh, you know, a software defined kit, SDK. So this SDK can be used for creating applications using different models of programming. Within Aneka, we support uh, you know, multiple, the three prominent ones that officially we released. One, of, one is called thread model programming, task model programming, second one, 
the third one is MapReduce. You can build your application using any of this model programming. So may, some of you may be already familiar with uh, third programming Java, the similar model programming within Aneka, you can create Aneka based third application and run it on a highly scalable uh, environment. Of course, Java threads, when you create an application with Java threads, it runs within one server. Your server has multiple cores, you can use all those cores. But what if your application need, need to support even more number of users that cannot be supported by one more as one server? What do you do? You cannot expand your application to other servers. Whereas with uh, Aneka based uh, approach, when you create application using Aneka threads, you can do it. So that is threat. Then MapReduce is another model of programming, very popular. We support it in Aneka. And the task model is also another popular one. Uh, uh, so I will discuss a bit more about this as we go along. Okay, that is SDK. And once you build your application, the application can be deployed either on a private cloud or a public cloud or across multiple private and public cloud in a seamless manner. Soon I will give some examples of uh, this scenario. Okay, the private cloud can be uh, a cloud that is set up in uh, your GLA university. So you can uh, create a you know, private cloud just by using existing servers and the desktop computers, make that an a based private cloud, use it for teaching, mm -hmm. use it for projects, and later on, if you want to use extra resource from public cloud, you can spin on the machine and combine these two. So that is called using public and private clouds in a seamless manner. Okay, uh, and public clouds means uh, the services like infrastructure services provided by Amazon or Microsoft or even the Google also you can rent those sorts of machines from them and use them. So there is a second component which makes it happen. There is a resource management scheduling system, the runtime machinery. Yes, yes, yes. You know, so of course, when you're at home, a lot of disturbance uh, come into picture. So suddenly, uh, okay, so I kept it there. Okay, so um, so those are two capabilities. Now, once you go deep inside Aneka, so Aneka has a container services. These days, the uh, concept of containers is becoming very popular in cloud computing. So within Aneka container, there are multiple services, uh, like such as membership management, reservation management, security uh, and say licensing. These are all set up services. Then uh, using the services, we create a task model, thread model or MapReduce. Uh, so like tomorrow you have a new idea for a application programming. For example, maybe you come out with a very special programming model for IoT application and you want to implement. You can actually extend Aneka services and implement your own. Or you like when you're deploying application, you want to deploy those based on privacy requirement. You can plug in a new scheduler and uh, to Aneka uh, that meets your requirement. So that way you can uh, support privacy aware resource management, privacy aware uh, computation. So I will give you some of the examples of how some of the users around the world have done it. So this uh, the technology is used by many around the world. So today I will just give you briefly uh, how China and also this uh, deep learning uh, was done. There are many applications. So in interest of time, I'll just present two. So first from China, China Southern Railways use it for locomotive design. Then uh, ISRO here in India, I mean, uh, they use it for satellite image processing. Washington State University, they use it for, uh, you know, creating privacy aware medical data analytics. So for example, <laughs> you, when you have a medical data, within medical data, you have challenges such as, you know, privacy requirements. And the medical records can be, uh, you know, sensitive records or non-sensitive records. When you have sensitive records, sensitive records, you don't want to send it to public cloud. You want to process them, process them in a local uh, cloud computing environment. Okay, and then the non-sensitive data you can do it on a public cloud. So, so this uh, Washington State University, they built deep learning approach towards classifying medical records, and then based on uh, the record sensitivity. So they are able to uh, process on a public cloud, remaining they are able to process on a public cloud. <laughs> of course, we are in this talk, you see, uh, people are also sharing if private uh, information. Can you ask some of the people uh, to disable their <laughs> unmute? Okay, I will do, let me see if I can do. Uh, okay, so hopefully they did. All right, um, so this is very difficult to control in the real world. You know, this is a public uh, seminar and everyone has their own uh, uh, situation. Anyway, so Washington State University is able to deploy medical application 
uh, uh, within a hospital cloud and also an Amazon cloud based on the data sensitivity. So this is where they have developed a deep learning method and that method classified the record and, in, uh, and plug to Aneka, then accordingly Aneka does as per their instruction. If the, uh, their deep learning method says this is sensitive record, Aneka will only send it to private cloud, otherwise it will public cloud. If you just search for Washington State University and Aneka cloud, you will see a detailed discussion on how they did it and I also uh, put it online on our website. And the deep learning, like this, there are many examples. Let me illustrate uh, a little more depth, uh, uh, two, three, and uh, uh, then we uh, move to next. So uh, this uh, China Southern Railways, what do they do? So they have various uh, train design scenarios. You know, they, they do rendering on a four core server and they're using uh, our uh, tool called Design Explorer and they were using software called Maya. Maya is application for uh, this uh, design evaluation. So when they were doing on a four core server, it was taking like four days, but they wanted to bring down the time to just say two hours. They set up a private cloud using an acre and our design explorer used to run this application as a SPMD, single program, multiple data application model that supported by Aneka. Are they able to run on a multiple uh, system network? Uh, here the data they gave us. On a single server, it took 80 hours, the same thing they're able to do in two hours. Now, instead of two hours, you might say, now because of urgency, I want result in 10 minutes, what do we do? If you want result in 10 minutes, the local resource takes uh, two hours, then uh, the result uh, they want answer in 10 minutes. What can we do? Within Aneka, there is a uh, you know, QA setting. You can go to Design Explorer, set deadline is equal to 10 minutes. Now, the local resource cannot do it in uh, 10 minutes, so we want to rent extra capability from a public cloud, from either Amazon, from Microsoft, or any Indian cloud. So for this, we have to pay for it. So therefore, we have to set a budget limit. You can say deadline is equal to 200, budget is equal to 200 rupees. Deadline is equal to 10 minutes, budget is equal to 200 rupees. So now the system looks into the constraints, deadline, local resource, and the budget limit. Accordingly, it will look into marketplace of cloud services, what is their price, according to the rental virtual machine, and then use them in a seamless manner. So this is the hybrid cloud, how we support in an income. Now coming to healthcare. So nowadays, health is an important aspect. So let me briefly present health, and then I will, uh, after that, I will share about uh, AI application. So in case of healthcare, you know, analyzing data. So the sensors, are ultimately in hospital, most of the time, they collect the patient data through different kinds of sensors, okay? One of the sensors here uh, that was developed here in Melbourne University was ECG analysis. So here the sensor, but nowadays the sensors are available in marketplace. You can just buy it for, you know, just 500 rupees the sensor that can collect your ECG data, and then uh, then you can have an app running on mobile phone, the data transport app, and from there you send it to cloud where application as a service available. Say for example, ECG as a software service, application service which you can run and you know, serve the users. So initially when you have, let's say you are a uh, such healthcare service provider running on Aneka on top of say Amazon or uh, Jure or whichever, so now, uh, when the application is running, initially you might have a few customers asking for this healthcare data analytics. You might say, yes, every request I issue from the uh, users, I will uh, answer them within one minute. Take the healthcare data, process it, and give the response back within a minute. That is your quality of service uh, promise that you made. Then, of course, for which they pay five rupees. Now, we have number of users increase more and more and more exponentially. So the resource that you provision is not able to meet the requirement. What do we do? So we have to dynamically add extra resource if in a public cloud. So Aneka support the dynamic uh, resource provisioning based on QS promises that are made to users. So this is a healthcare application where we are able to combine, uh, you know, sensing, the mobility, and the cloud. The cloud means the services and the platform and also infrastructure. So this was uh, demonstrated there, and we regularly demonstrate the cloud-centric healthcare service. You can see we connected the sensor to person hand from the data went to cloud, where they send it, send it to a mobile phone to cloud, where processing is done, we just come back, and you can see different graphs on that uh, mobile phone. So this graph can be used for, you know, for various purposes. Say, for example, uh, you know, uh, one of these graphs can be used to find out how many of us person has left yesterday night. So this can be very useful information in terms of deciding who can join the seminar. If somebody has not slept at all yesterday night, there's no point in having them. Otherwise, they'll be just sitting in the computer and sleeping, correct? And their phone is ringing and making noise. 
So, so it can be obviously controlled. But the other cases, like depend upon our health scenario, you know, how much exercise we have to do, or, uh, or, um, or uh, what is our body situation like. So all that can be uh, analyzed, and then that can be reported without actual consulting to the physical doctor, so instead uh, healthcare analytics. So, so that is our healthcare. Now coming to object detection. So these days, uh, AI and deep learning has become very popular. So you know the skills in the industry, they are seeking people with excellent skills in machine learning, uh, AI, deep learning methods. And here we did one work on object detection. Like for example, you know, lots of uh, vehicles are moving on the car, uh, road. And this object detection can be very useful, especially in COVID situation. In COVID situation, everywhere control. So they are saying people cannot walk on the street, cannot assemble too much, maintain social distance. Then how do we enforce? Of course, in uh, India, they have police everywhere running and we see photos where they're trying to chase people. But whereas in Australia, there is no such thing. They just, you know, let people uh, hope, uh, expect that they automatic uh, follow. If they notice through camera, then they, uh, you know, issue a big fine, fine up like a thousand dollar per person. That will be like a 50,000 rupees, very expensive. Anyway, so if you, have, if you have cameras in different places, cameras are monitoring. So it can be useful to find out how many people are on the road. And who are they? Object detection. Is it car? Is it human? Or is it a mouse or a dog? Whatever. The different types of things are moving around. So uh, here is an example where we did deep learning library. So there are deep learning libraries that classify records, uh, that classify objects. Uh, the photos are taken through, say, camera and comes to a device. And then uh, yes. So here is one person, two, three, three and, uh, you know, muted and uh, we can hear what they're doing. Maybe they're drinking coffee or tea, hopefully. All right, so now uh, coming to this uh, object detection. Uh, here, so there is a, already a uh, object detection library available in Python. So we, may, we took that Python library for object detection and made that an anchor task. When number of images are coming in through this, uh, you know, uh, say cameras, then we process that in parallel by using resources, local resource and remote resources. In one of our experiments we did, we written a detailed paper on this. So here, you know, an ECA uh, server run, running on a recover, uh, worker on a server one, worker on another one. Then uh, we have another worker on, uh, this is in Azure, another worker on Amazon. So when the request comes in, so initially try to do all this deep learning of the detection on the local resource. When extra is necessary to use other extra, because then finally, so here when we feed a version image like this in a computer lab, then uh, after processing, it is able to display, it is able to, you know, low latency output or high latency output. In case of high accuracy, you can see it classified. Oh, he, these many monitors, these many chairs, these many mouse, these many keyboards, monitor. Then other places, bit less uh, quality. But anyway, you can see, this is very useful in universities also to find out how many students are in the lab. So how many persons? Or do we have uh, all the computers in the hub? Did somebody take away some computer? Uh, so all that can be uh, just by having uh, this camera monitoring and then you can detect. So this will be fantasy application. If it was done in a scalable manner, uh, and then it deployed in different uh, cities in India, I think we don't need so many police. They can easily detect where are the assembly of people and where they're not following the rules, social distancing, where they are, uh, even though government put rules, but nobody follows or some are following. So you can detect them. I monitor and manage them. So this is one example of object detection. So this application of object detection can be useful in so many areas, including security, enforcing rules and regulation, perhaps maintaining, uh, uh, you know, spread of uh, this epidemic spread can be controlled, managed, uh, regulated from such application. So I think this is something I'm encouraging. Maybe some of the students can perhaps take up such project right now, you know, do it on Aneka. Okay, so uh, the Aneka software, you know, so I uh, we uh, I can just speak this for one semester course, but anyway, in the interest of time. So if you want to learn and uh, explore it with yourself, visit manzasub.com, uh, then uh, download and explore. So there are many students out of the world did interesting applications. They downloaded, wrote their own application, and some of them publish uh, short papers. Some of them publish serious papers on our Manzasub website. If you visit Manzasub website, and then you will find at about in uh, publication. You will see many examples, uh, uh, you know, uh, these discussed. In fact, this object detection one uh, is also a uh, paper is there online. Next And 
And of course, uh, there are many universities around the world uh, in China, especially teaching uh, courses uh, that use Seneca. But in India in particular, this is uh, interesting. So you can see the many universities uh, throughout India have introduced the cloud computing curriculum and quite a bit of them have set up Seneca based laboratory and then teaching uh, courses in this area. Then of course, I understand that this IBM, uh, the curriculum on uh, data computer science, which is in cloud computing, that also has a uh, subject called cloud application programming. And if you open up that cloud application programming very depth, you will notice that that uh, content is actually coming from our book, Mastering Cloud Computing, and the lab exercise, uh, I hope uh, you will be doing soon. So that is actually done through an ACA, uh, an ACA based laptop programming. So we are pleased that uh, now countrywide, so there are many insta installations of an ACA, uh, university have set up private cloud uh, laboratories and using it for teaching, uh, teaching subjects in cloud computing. So that is about, uh, you know, cloud computing challenges, how it is supported in ACA with a few applications. So now let me look into this uh, IoT, Internet of Things. Why this is so important now and why it became popular? You know, as I said in the beginning, uh, uh, internet is uh, networks of networks of computers, and that concept has moved to networks of everything. So what are those things? Things can be the roads, things can be temple, things can be uh, with the camera at a home, uh, things can be a watch that I'm wearing. So I am just wearing Hanumanji band. You know, Hanumanji can be a protector, but I can wear a, a you know electronics uh, IoT watch that can monitor my data, heartbeat data, to see how I'm doing, correct? So, so these are the different things. And when we have these things, what can we do? We can create many interesting uh, applications, smart healthcare, smart agriculture, smart transport, smart cities, everything smart. Anyway, so, you know, here is the data that talks about, uh, right now, 50 billion objects are online. By 2030, by 2030, so my aim is to discuss you about by 2030, uh, this will double, you know, 10 times more. So when you have massive number of such objects available, then if you now build the application that are cloud centric, what happens? If all of these uh, billions and billions of objects pushing data to cloud, what happens? The internet get clogged. Not only internet get clogged, the response time latency will be very high. So this is where we need to look into, you know, uh, different model of computing. And meanwhile, in terms of economic opportunity, in five years time, by 2025, only one trillion dollar opportunity is available for you know, exploring this IoT based application opportunity and impact. So this is a great thing. That is why IoT is also considered as one of the important area. And this IoT is being adopted for many applications around the world. Then what are those applications? So you can see there are many, many of these interesting. So um, uh, applications of this IoT, Okay, somebody's drawing. No, okay. So you can see IoT applications in uh, uh, in uh, home. You can make you know uh, smart home. So what is this uh, uh, smart home means? Uh, like uh, you know uh, managing what resources are consumed at home. When to turn on the heater? When to turn up? Or when to our fridge? For example, if your fridge is uh, part of IoT, it may send you a SMS message saying that hey. Uh, we are running out of uh, following vegetables or the milk at, uh, at our home. So like that. So uh, making it uh, smoother or so secure. Then the healthcare which I talked about, smart city. So like this, many, many applications are there of this IoT. And that is why we need a new class of computing paradigm. So this is where comes five minutes computing. So let me make it more clear. So in case of the traditional one, the first one is the cloud centering IoT application. The, f the few applications that we saw earlier were the cloud centering. So, but with the emergence of so many IoTs, if you try to push all the data to cloud, what happens? The internet will clogged and latency will be high. So to overcome that limitation, the new model that is fog and edge computing can come into picture. What is this fog edge computing? Is instead of pushing data to a cloud, a remote centralized place, we can harness the resources in the edge of the network. Like uh, the resources at home, resources uh, at the office, uh, harness them along with the cloud as necessary. That is called edge and fog computing. So just using edge resource is a pure edge. Then if you're using both edge and the fog in, in, in a, a seamless manner, that is called fog computing, okay? And then when we say fog computing, how does it look like? So at the top, at the end, we have a cloud infrastructure. And then at the beginning, we have the devices. 
the request comes in, there'll be a gateway, gateway node, where gateway node can be your mobile phone, and then from there, data sent to a cloud computing uh, brokering environment. So here is a cloud resource broker, which receives the request accordingly, find out what resources are the locally, what the uh, resources in the core of the network, what is with the cloud, accordingly use them and deliver capability to the users. So this is the conceptual diagram. And in this direction, we developed a software called FogBus. FogBus is a software framework for creating uh, edge and for computing uh, applications uh, where you can deliver those services with the low latency requirement. Plus also in, in this case, you also have a trustability. When I use resources from different places, can I trust those resources? So this trustability is these days assured through blockchain. You know, blockchain is popularly uh, pop gave, became popular in the context of digital currency like bitcoins. But the same blockchain can be used for various purposes, and one of them is this uh, enhancing specific results in the care of healthcare. So we added uh, blocks to the task. So here is the uh, user. You know, the oxygen for example, healthcare. The data comes to the gateway, which is a mobile phone on which app is running. That makes a request to a broker, which is a Fogbus resource broker. Fogbus resource broker can use the local uh, edge resources. And edge resources can be a not big computer like laptop or servers. It can be a uh, Raspberry Pi. Raspberry Pi is a small matchbox size computer available for say, you know, say 500 rupees. Uh, that matchbox like computer can be used to run the various small scale uh, workers of any uh, Fogbus. Then, uh, use it for creating uh, low latency uh, re oriented, real time oriented applications and run that locally. And then, of course, sometimes you need a public cloud access also. So, we linked. So, if the local resource is unable to meet, it will spin a task on Azure or any other public cloud using Aneka. So, this is linked with Aneka also. So, that way, uh, though both uh, edge computing resource and the cloud resource can be used in a seamless manner. That is through Bugbus. And of course, uh, let me show you with one uh, example with healthcare. So of course, uh, healthcare is one of the popular area. So IoT based healthcare solutions, and uh, this can be used for you know health system monitor management at the uh, hospital or the remote healthcare. Like uh, we, we saw like ECG monitoring, blood pressure monitoring, oxygen. Monitoring. There are many interesting applications that patient can be there in a remote home, and then the data collected and processed. So here is one, um, uh, uh, this is another interesting application called sleep apnea analysis. Like people are sleeping, sometimes people sleep there, sometimes they get, uh, uh, you know, like a choke. So this is called apnea, sleep apnea problem. So how do we detect and manage it? So here are the, some healthcare uh, sensor like oximeter that you can tie finger to your finger and sleep. And of course, uh, it monitors your data and the data can be sent to application. So here is one application called sleep apnea analysis. So this data that we process and send it to uh, the processing there, and that application is able to tell us what is the state of this person. So the, the situation like sleep apnea problem, is it mild, is it normal, is it severe? If it is normal, no need to worry. If it is mild, maybe at some point of in few months time, you must see the doctor and see what you can do, uh, how to overcome the problem. And if it is very severe, in system is to detect that okay, if this person is not taken care of within half an hour, you know, he might die. So that emergency signal raising and action. So this is a very interesting healthcare application where we are able to combine, uh, you know, uh, all this capability. And this was the demo that we have shown. You can see we connected this sensor to person hand, then data collected and processed, and we had a edge uh, cloud edge uh, capability. So these are the Raspberry Pis that we use and created the edge resource. Of course, if it is a nice one, there'll be a small box. You can have a box, small box at home in the corner, small box at the signaling system, at the transport system that can help detect and then do things, do uh, this uh, analytics and then give results very fast. So this is the combining. So that is about uh, you know, um, healthcare. And we also have a simulator called IFOXIM uh, that is mostly for uh, those who want to do uh, you know, research or PhD. So instead of building the real stuff, you can do modeling and simulation. So we have a, a new software called iFoxim. So earlier for cloud computing, we had something called CloudSim, is a simulator for cloud computing. iFoxim is a simulator for fog and its computing. So particularly targeting hybrid applications. Okay, so that is, uh, uh, so if you search for I, iFoxim on internet, you will find uh, both software and many example uh, you know, systems and other innovation people around the world have done it. 
Okay, so let me summarize and uh, talk about feature direction, and then after that we can have a question on the session. To summarize, there are several computing paradigms have promised this vision of how to make computing as reality. So today we call cloud computing that turns this vision into reality. Then of course with uh, the with rapid adoption of cloud computing, then the need for multi-cloud is created many more opportunity for innovate. But meanwhile, existing infrastructure that has created is already used for creating an exciting application that are uh, used in day to day. So on ACA, we also discussed how it support this elasticity. You know, elasticity is the important feature. And in a market oriented where user define the requirement in terms of deadline, time, in terms of price they are willing to pay, according to the system, rent the resource for you in the marketplace and deliver service to you. So Aneka uh, is you know, popular for building application rapidly. So here our focus is how can we minimize the cost of software engineering? If you want to create application, you should be able to set up very quickly. So if you search on the you know, on internet, you search for Aneka in the cloud computing on the paper, research paper, you will come across many interesting smartphone paper done by undergraduate students. Even though they may be small scale, but they set up themselves quickly, then learn, and then uh, created some deep learning or machine learning algorithm and the wrote smartphone paper also. So the uh, applications of Aneka in many areas, I have discussed briefly from China, so uh, engineering application, healthcare also briefly, but there are many more like gaming application, network games, the highly scalable network games, uh, examples, business analytics, AI. So in interest of time and in present, but you can read more in the book. So this internet of things, of course, is driving new innovation. So the first generation internet of things were cloud centric, but now the next generation has to be really edge centric or fox centric. Edge means the pure edge resource, cloud means the pure cloud, the fog means using both the key edge and the cloud together. So this way we can reduce the burden on the internet, reduce the load of the internet, then also create applications that are low latency, that means real-time oriented application. So looking into the future, you know, so last year we put together this manifesto for future generation cloud computing. So there you will see there are many, many open challenges. I will just give briefly uh, you know, one of them, but there are many open challenges from all angles of cloud computing at the level of heterogeneity of different hardware. Like these days, you know, you probably heard, heard something called TPU, Transaction Processing Unit, and then and, uh, FVGA and GPUs. Uh, the different type of hardware are coming. How do you use them in a seamless manner? Next, how do we manage security? Then how do you manage privacy? Then how do you manage scale across multiple cloud data center? And how do you decrease the, manage the energy consumption of the cloud data center? And how do you deal with multiple computing users? Then how do you deal with when you scale across multiple places? How do you manage the failures? Okay, if it fails one place, how do we seamlessly uh, scale across? So these are our uh, challenges that are discussed uh, in this article. You can see the contributions for this article come from experts around the world that are uh, listed here. So one of the challenges is called holistic resource management. So in cloud, there are varieties of resources, compute resource, network resource, applications, data management, centralized, then the energy sources can be, you know, brown energy or the renewable energy, and then of course, uh, the consumers of resource, not only compute and network, but also air conditioning system. So how do you manage the holistic manner? So this is one of the important big challenge uh, open for some of you to explore in the future. And to learn more about cloud computing to start with, here is our book, Mastering Cloud Computing. So this is the American edition. Uh, so this uh, cost you around uh, 100 US dollar. I think right now 100 US dollar is probably close to 8,000 rupees. Not affor affordable in India. So we have Indian solution, which is just for 400 or 500 rupees. You can buy it from Agra Hill in India. The same book, same content, but of course there is a, uh, the different publishers uh, have edited in differently, they're presented differently uh, to the audience, uh, but it's overall it is the same, you know, 90%, it is similar. Okay, so that is for Indian audience uh, for 500 rupees, but American audience, 8,000 rupees. But if you want to take the same book to the China, that is $3, you know, $100, uh, like $8, and then $3. So Chinese, Chinese edition. So in a Chinese language. So the book is also available. So in China, it is popularly used. So that is the part, uh, you know, cloud computing. Then regarding IoT. So we published a book through Elsevier, called Internet of Things. That's also uh, available. Uh, then, uh, you know, recently, this uh, few months, uh, actually almost a year ago, the Dead Computing book also published and release in the marketplace, where you can study more about, you know, especially ads and fog, these are, you know, moving target. 
you know lot of advance necessary even my uh, this other book uh, that uh, uh, our cloud computing this book if you see the last chapter it discuss about future directions and there are so many open issues that are available so some of you who become expert today in the today's technology then based on this you can look in the future direction and do advances extend the technology create new application create new approach to the way uh, applications are created all those are open directions this is a you know for some of you who want to do project you can explore okay so let me stop here and thank you very much for your patient hearing okay so i will stop and of course here are my contacts so you are most welcome to contact us by email or um, other way but meanwhile what i will do is i will stop here then i will let you ask questions either typing in a chat room or you can ask if you can manage thank you very much thank you